All right, folks, we've got lots of new people joining the meeting right now. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say hello. My name is Leah Cuddyback and I'll be in the background making sure everything's going smoothly. As more folks file in, we'll kind of just give folks the space to get logged in. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and pass this to Jason since it's now 1101. And Jason Pinchback from the General Land Office is gonna lead us through and give you all the rundown on how things are gonna flow today. So take it away, Jason. Thank you so much, Leah. Good morning, my name is Jason Pinchback. I work at the Texas General Land Office in the Coastal Resources Division. Welcome to our second installment of our Lunch and Learn series featuring uh, Mr. Brian Sims from the Houston Galveston Area Council of Governments. I would like to first thank uh, Leah Cuddyback from Texas State, the Meadow Center for Water and the Environment, as well as Brian DeSanti from our NOAA Coastal Fellow from Texas General Land Office for helping to uh, do the planning, preparation, and facilitation of the event. Part of our, our overarching goal and mission of Clean Coast Texas is we're aiming to enhance non-point source and water quality management and reduce the negative environmental impacts of stormwater runoff. Now, it's an easy thing to say, how do, how do we help to manage NPS pollution, but it's a really difficult thing to do on the ground. So we have developed a variety of resources within our program, such as uh, assistance with local planning efforts, uh, assistance with ordinance development. We have technical resources, uh, such as our sustainable drainage manual. Uh, we're also hosting workshops and engaging uh, with decision makers through our partnership with Texas Sea Grant and Texas Community Watershed Partners. Uh, we are also conducting data analysis as well as retrofit planning. And, and retrofit planning is a concept of how do we reimagine an existing land use that might be creating a, a negative impact for water resources? How do we reimagine that, how we could construct it in a way that would be more beneficial? So part of the other concept with our Lunch and Learn here is um, we have speakers, our, our last one last month focused on uh, our coastal beaches and beach water quality through the lens of the Texas Beach Watch program and that data. And our, our one today is gonna to feature uh, Mr. Brian Sims, as I had mentioned, but part of the concept here is we wanna learn about these specific instances, but we're hoping that this information could also spur discussions or ideas of, of different concepts and approaches for, for managing water quality in communities that could be applied in other areas. So on that note, how many septic systems are there in our coastal zone? It, it used to be a mysterious question to ask with, without a real answer to it. Uh, but what we found out uh, through AgriLife's uh, research is that we have over 58,000 septic systems in our coastal zone. And many of those are in close proximity to water bodies. While many of these are functioning appropriately without issue, there are also many that are failing or are impacted by uh, changes in sea level rise or water tables. And so when excessive bacteria and pathogens impact our local economies, our shellfish and our tourism industries can be negatively impacted. Um, when we look at water quality, uh, it turns out that bacteria and the associated pathogens create uh, some major issues when it comes to impairments in streams. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Brian Sims, a senior planner at the Houston Galveston Area Council of Government to share information related to his program that they're running and how that program is affecting and impacting and improving water quality. Mr. Brian Sims. I thank you, thank you, Jason. Hi. Um... Uh, my name is Brian Sims. I'm a senior planner with the um, Houston Galveston uh, Area Council. Uh, at, at the council, I'm involved in multiple projects, uh, the primary ones being the Clean Rivers Program, the Water Quality Management Plan, and our on-site sewage facility program. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Uh, let me share my screen. All right. In just one second. All right. Um, so can everybody see my uh, presentation? Brian, we can see your speaker's notes as well right now. Okay. Uh, let me um, let me see if I can switch that over. All right. How is that? Awesome. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, 
the first thing I want to go over is um, just to give a brief introduction on uh, what is the Houston Galveston Area Council for those who, who aren't familiar. Um, uh, we are the uh, Council of Governments for the Houston Galveston region, one of the largest Council of Governments in the country. Uh, we are comprised of 13 counties uh, and more than 100 member cities. Uh, we, we serve a geographical area of approximately 12,500 square miles and a population of more than 7 million people. Um, and the area that is served by HGAC includes five of the counties that are that are in the Texas coastal zone, uh, being Chambers, a portion of Harris County, Galveston County, Brazoria, and Matagorda. I am in the Water Resources Department of uh, HGAC, and we are involved in several different facets of water quality uh, throughout the region. Uh, this includes managing the Regional Surface Water Quality Monitoring Program. We are the, the largest uh, partner in TCEQ's uh, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality's Clean Rivers Program, where we do surface water quality monitoring throughout the basin. Uh, as part of that, we also do data analysis and reporting. Uh, such as our basin highlights and basin summary reports that, that we do uh, to report on water quality within the region. Uh, we work on the development of watershed based plans, such as watershed protection plans and total maximum daily loads. Um, and these programs are done through throughout the region. We do uh, water quality management planning where we look at uh, infrastructure and do analysis of that infrastructure, discharge monitoring reports, sanitary sewer overflows, uh, things of that nature, determine their impact on water quality within the region. Um, we do mapping of sewage facilities, with uh, on-site sewage facilities within, within the region. Uh, Jason mentioned earlier some of the, uh, the database that is done for the uh, Texas Coastal Zone, and we contribute data to that to that as well for the counties that are in our portion of the coastal zone. Uh, we have a, um, we manage a homeowner wastewater assistance program to help homeowners repair and replace their failing septic systems or on-site sewage facilities. And that'll be one of the primary topics I talked to you about today. Uh, we also do uh, public outreach and education and we coordinate the annual rivers, lakes, bays, and bayous trash bash, which we just held recently for the first time virtually. So the first thing that I want to talk about is just uh, kind of a brief overview in, of our water quality monitoring assessments that we do within the region, just because this kind of ties in to everything else that we do. So as I mentioned earlier, HGAC manages the Clean Rivers Program in the Houston Galveston region in coordination with Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and several local partners. Uh, we, we do monitoring in the uh, Trinity San Jacinto Coastal Basin, the San Jacinto River Basin, the San Jacinto Brazos Coastal Basin, the Brazos Colorado Coastal Basin and the Bays and Estuaries. Um, we do monitoring, assessment, and public outreach and education throughout the region. Uh, our monitoring region includes 15 counties. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, HGAC's area includes 13 counties, but because this is based upon watersheds and not geographical boundaries, we include a portion of Grimes and San Jacinto counties as well. So in this 15 county region, this map shows uh, the monitoring stations that we have. Uh, the region has 16,000 miles of streams and shorelines. We, and we have seven partner agencies monitoring 370 uh, professionally monitored sites, and we have 103 volunteer monitoring sites through the Texas Stream Team. Uh, part of uh, what we do, uh, we make our, our water quality data available on our website in an interactive format. Uh, this is called our Water Resources Information Map, or the RIM. Uh, and this allows you to look at water bodies through uh, through an interactive mapping utility. Uh, so you can look at the different river basins or watersheds within the region. Each segment within 
The map is clickable, so you can find out information about each water body. You can turn on multiple GIS layers, so you can turn on like a monitoring station layer. You can click on that layer, find out information about that monitoring station, who monitors it, historical water quality data, trend analysis, things of that nature. And you can also download any of the data that is available online uh, if, you, if you want to examine it further. Um, so as I mentioned, we use this data in evaluation of water quality throughout the region. So as, as we look at the water quality, this data is based off the uh, 2020 Texas Integrated Report. But in the Houston Galveston region, approximately 42% of the stream miles within the region are impaired for elevated levels of bacteria. 22% uh, of the stream miles are impaired are impaired or have a concern due to depressed levels of dissolved oxygen. And 33% of the stream miles in the region exceed nutrient screening levels for nutrients such as uh, ammonia or nitrate or phosphorus. Uh, so the, the goals of our programs are not only to look at these impairments, to, but to try to figure out what the sources of those impairments are and what we as an agency can do to, to fix that. Uh, the primary one that we're going to be focusing on today is going to be the uh, bacteria impairments and concerns. So there, there are numerous potential sources of bacteria within our region's waterways, including both point and non-point source, uh, sources of pollution. Some of the most common sources are related to uh, uh, wastewater infrastructure, such as the wastewater discharges, sanitary sewer overflows, stormwater runoff. Um, with sanitary sewer overflows being a particular concern there. Uh, you also have issues such as uh, the concentrated animal feeding operations, uh, agriculture, animal waste, uh, pet waste. Uh, but the one that we're going to focus on primarily today is going to be the on-site sewage facilities or septic systems. Um, and uh, how they can, I'm going to talk about how they can impact water quality and also a program that that we've developed to help kind of mediate some of some of those issues. Uh, so uh, just a little background on on-site on sewage facilities or OSSFs for short. Uh, these are used in areas where it's not, not possible to connect to a residential sanitary sewer collection facility. So you put a small sewage treatment facility on site at the at the home, which is where it's given its name. Um, there's multiple types of these systems. Uh, there's the aerobic treatment systems that are the most common used today. And then there's the conventional septic systems. They're, and both types of systems are used extensively throughout the region. Um, not all septics, not all on-site septic facilities are septic systems, but sometimes those terms will be used interchangeably. So if, if I switch between terminology, that's, just know that I'm referring to OSSFs or on-site sewage facilities as a whole, including both aerobic and conventional. Um, a lot of the older systems within the region are the conventional type systems. Um, many of these were put into place before there was a, a requirement by the state for the systems to be permitted, uh, which came into play in 1989. So a lot of these older systems are considered grandfathered. So they, they don't necessarily have a permit. So there's really no record of them. Many of them were installed just by the homeowner with uh, no, no permit required. So part of our issue is trying to figure out where those unpermitted systems are so we can get a true understanding of how many systems are in the region. Um, the on-site sewage facilities provide effective and appropriate treatment of wastewater if they're properly designed, installed, operated, and maintained. Uh, unfortunately, many of the older systems have reached the end of their useful life. A lot of times these conventional systems are in a soil type that doesn't necessarily support that type of system. So they don't function as effectively as they should. Um, and with the aerobic systems, a lot of times homeowners don't provide proper maintenance, so that can lead to system failure as well. Uh, so what happens when an on-site sewage facility fails? Um, if the system fails, 
uh, it will not properly treat the wastewater that it receives. Uh, in this case, it's going to discharge partially treated or untreated wastewater to the surface. Uh, once this water is on the surface, uh, good rain comes by, it flows into the local waterway through, through stormwater runoff, or in many cases, if it's close to the waterway, it can be directly deposited uh, straight into the stream or creek. Um, so there, there are many different factors that can contribute to a system failure, such as a lack of maintenance, the age of the system, a design is, that's not appropriate to the amount of water use or soil type or alteration to the drain field. For, for example, if, the, if you have a conventional system with a field line and the property floods during a hurricane, uh, settle, uh, soil could settle in that drain line, clog it up, then the system starts backing up. So there, there's numerous factors that can affect you know, the functioning of these systems. So how big of a problem can this be? Well, um, like I said, as it was stated before, when these function properly, they, they work very well. When they fail though, they tend to fail spectacularly. And um, just doing a little basic math, uh, looking at what potential bacteria loading can come from one of these systems. You know, assuming that there's a concentration of 1 million bacteria per 100 milliliters and a average flow water usage of 70 gallons per person per day and an average of 2.86 persons per household you're looking at 75 billion 800 million bacteria per system per day that can can potentially be discharged to the surface uh, to take this one step further, if you're looking at a watershed and there's 100 sewage facilities within that watershed and a 15% failure rate, which is about average for the state, statewide estimate is 12%. At a 15% failure rate of 100 systems, you're now looking at 1 trillion, 137 billion bacteria that could potentially enter that waterway. Um, for reference, the water quality standard is 126 bacteria per 100 milliliters. So you can see this could be a significant potential source of, of bacteria. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we as an agency focus on this, this source. So uh, the first thing that we do to look at the impact of, of failing on-site sewage facilities on water quality in the region is to develop a mapping system for these these systems. You know, each individual county is pretty much left to do their, their own thing. Uh, so what we try to do is regionalize this as best as we could within our region by working with the different permitting authorities known as authorized agents within our region to consolidate their permitting data and, and create an interactive map that we can use um, to look at these systems and their proximity to different watersheds. So um, our, right now we're covering the entire 13 county region. We're trying to bring in additional counties such as San Jacinto and Grimes that are outside HGAC service area, but within our Clean Rivers program monitoring area. Uh, so far we have we have permitting data for approximately 92,000 systems within the region. And we have estimated there's an additional 200,000 that are out there that aren't permitted. Uh, this, this system is available uh, online um, at the website indicated on, on the slide. So what can we do with this system? We have uh, multiple different, different options that are available to us uh, that serve several different functions in, water, in our water quality planning efforts. Uh, for example, in this uh, first image, uh, you can look at the number of on-site sewage facilities per square mile in different areas of the region. Green is less concentrated, red is most concentrated, just like the normal weather map that you would you would see on your, your evening news. Um, you can also, with this, look at the age of the system based upon the, the permit data. Uh, in this second image, uh, this is a zoomed in image, you can look at the location of individual on-site sewage facilities based upon their GIS data. Um, 
You notice there's two separate colors here around this reservoir. Uh, one of those is permits issued by the river authority. The other is by the county, um, both of which are authorized agents in the region. So it allows you to look also by permitting entity, but there's also measurement tools. So you can you can do a measurement distance between the system and the watershed or the, or the water body to determine, you know, how far away it is from that water body to determine, you know, how much of a potential problem it could be if it failed. Uh, this final image we um, shows how we are able to use the system to evaluate where we expect there to be unpermitted systems. Uh, we do this by looking at parcel data where there are, aren't any permitted systems and compare that to where systems are known to exist and also where there's a service area boundary of a wastewater treatment facility. So we know where the people are on on residential sewer and we, so we can determine which ones of those on on those that are outside that service area boundary should have a system and we use that to estimate our unpermitted systems uh, and all that data is used in our uh, development of our watershed based plans so now that we've identified that failing ossfs can be a leading contributor to bacteria uh, we wanted to look at a program that we could implement to help homeowners repair and replace those systems. Uh, unfortunately, the costs to repair and replace these systems are beyond the means of many homeowners, uh, especially those on, on, on lower income brackets. Um, so we established our homeowner wastewater assistance program to help those, those people in repairing those systems. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, you know, about the program, how it was created, how it was funded, and the qualifications to participate in the program, and finally some success stories that we've had with with the program. Uh, so first, our, our program um, was set up through a supplemental environmental project, uh, also known as an SEP, uh, through the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with the SEP program, uh, it's a program that Texas Commission on Environment and Quality has set up to allow for the creation of pro projects that prevent pollution, reduce, amount of, reduce the amount of pollution reaching the environment, or enhance the quality of the environment. And these programs are set up so that uh, a respondent to an enforcement action by TCEQ can agree to contribute to one of these projects as part of a settlement to offset some of the environmental fines that they may have received. There's numerous programs throughout the state related to various topics, uh, uh, household chemical uh, removal, tire removal, um, vehicle upgrades, uh, septic systems. And this is what our focus is on is the on-site sewage facilities within the 13 county region. So as I stated, you know, our, this project started through the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality's SEP program. Uh, that's where our funding was first received starting in 2014. Uh, there was a caveat with this funding though, and that is that the funds cannot be used to assist homeowners who are under an enforcement action for OSSF violations. So had the county has already identified that a homeowner is in violation because their system has failed. Unfortunately, we can't use TCEQ money to assist those homeowners. However, we have begun in 2016, we began to receive money through the Harris County District Attorney's Office. They, they liked our program and what we were doing and they approached us about uh, supporting our SEP program. They actually support approximately 10 different SEP programs through their environmental pen penalties that they receive through their court enforcement cases. Uh, with these funds, they do allow us to use those for homeowners who are under enforcement because they realize that those are the ones that are most likely to be contributing to bacterial problems and they want to, to fix that problem. So they, and because they're a private source of this funding, they they don't have that same restriction as TCEQ. They also view the water quality as a regional issue, not just a Harris County issue. So they allow us to use the funding in any county within the region. 
in addition to those sources, we also have a few uh, local industries in Brazoria County that contribute to the program through their employee giving programs. Uh, although with this funding, it is limited to that to that county, to Brazoria County. So a quick overview of the program. Um, our, our program allows for the funding of the repair or replacement of a failing on-site sewage facility. Uh, we cover 100% of the costs associated with that, including the design, the permitting, and the installation of the system, as well as the first two years of a maintenance contract, um, provided that the homeowner meets the income and ownership requirements. Um, and we, we make payments directly to the vendors, uh, so there's no pass through through the homeowner. Uh, we, we have to bid these repairs and installations out to meet state purchasing requirements, though. Uh, and that's been uh, one of the, I'll discuss that in a little bit, but that's been one of the slowbacks at, at the start of the project. So how, do, how does someone qualify for our program? Uh, the first step is they must own and reside in the home. So it can't be a rental property or a vacation home. It can't be a new construction, although we can repair an existing home if the home was damaged due to repair, weather, things of that nature. Uh, no multifamily complexes and no commercial properties. So it has to be someone's primary residence and they have to, to live in that home. And they also must own the home and the property that the home is on. Uh, that is due to the permitting requirements. Uh, when a system is permitted, an affidavit is filed that ties that system to the deed. So they have to own the property as well as the home in order for the, the, the permitting step. They also must be within one of the eligible counties and they must meet the income requirements. Now the income requirements for this program are based off of 80% of the median household income for the county in which the applicant resides. Uh, this includes the all the combined income from everyone in the home and all sources of income such as any wages, alimony, social security, uh, disability, uh, retirement, um, etc. So the, the, the values that we use are from the, uh, the, the HUD medium income limits for the Texas counties. So each different county has a different limit based upon the median household uh, income for that county. So if you look at say Harris County for an example, in a household with two people, in order to qualify, the combined income would have to be less than $47,950 per year. As you move up to say five people in the household, you're now at 64,700. So it's kind of a sliding scale based upon the number of households. But if you look at a county like Brazoria County, which has a lot more higher paying industrial jobs, you get a higher median income. So the qualifications are different there. So we look at each, each county individually in our program. In order to um, qualify someone for this, this program, we do require documentation of their income. Uh, this could be tax returns, social security benefits letters, because uh, many people on social security aren't required to uh, file tax returns. Uh, we can look at bank statements showing deposits, pay stubs, things of this nature, just to make sure that people are under that limit. Uh, we also have to document ownership of the property this is usually done through a combination of getting a copy of the deeds and also the property tax records just to make sure that they are the property owner on record and they are up to date uh, with their property taxes. We also document that the system is failing. Uh, we do this by doing a, uh, an on-site visit to the property where we take multiple photographs of the system. This is not only done to verify that it's failing, but also provides us information to develop a request for proposals to send out to the installers uh, within the region. So what kind of costs are we looking at for these systems? Um, as you can see by this table, the cost can be pretty high. I think the, the most expensive system that we've repaired was 17,000. Uh, the average cost is 11,000. 
which is a lot, especially with most of these installers, um, most of them require payment up front. In some cases, you can do 50% down, 50% at installation, but it's very rare that you can finance one of these unless you refinance your house. Um, and if you're looking at someone on Social Security that's making $1,200 a month, looking at an $11,000 bill to replace their septic system, they had to basically choose between repairing the septic system or keeping their electricity on. So most people want to do the right thing. It's just simply a matter of they don't have the money to do it. And that's where a program like this comes in to assist those homeowners in doing, doing the right thing. Um, so for our vendors for our program, uh, this is also one of the, um, the biggest challenges we had developing our project was finding qualified vendors within the region. Uh, there were there were numerous vendors, obviously, but because of our purchasing requirements and most people needing the money up front to cover their own costs for the, the tanks and the labor to put these in, it was hard to find vendors that were willing to work at the program initially. Uh, once word of mouth got around, we, we got some, some new people in, but basically we require someone to be a licensed on-site sewage facility professional. So they have to be an OS2 licensed installer by TCQ, and they have to be in good standing with TCQ and the local authorized agent. So if, if they have been under enforcement by TCQ or the authorized agent, they're not eligible for our program. Uh, they also had to maintain a liability insurance policy of a million dollars per incur of a, per occurrence. Uh, this is one thing that kind of limited the number of installers as well, because a small, smaller one or two person operation doesn't necessarily have the liability insurance requirements that we need as an agency to make sure that we're covered for this work that we're doing on people's property. Uh, we also require a net 30 day payment terms uh, with vendors being paid directly by check or direct deposit. Um, like I stated, this became kind of an issue when we were first setting up, um, mainly because the installers typically require payment upfront from homeowners, but we, we weren't able to do that as a political subdivision of the state uh, due to our purchasing policy. So each, each system we, we bid out individually. Um, we require written quotes from at least three vendors and with work awarded to the lowest qualified vendor who meets specifications. Uh, because we're working in 13 counties, we have vendors in each county that we solicit those bids to. We don't have any vendors that work in all of the areas. Most of them are specialized in just two or three counties, but typically each time we send out requests, it's to five or six vendors per county. Uh, we get referrals to our program through our um, watershed-based planning meetings. When we do a watershed uh, protection plan, we usually include some OSSF training within that watershed based plan. So at our public meetings, we promote this program. We also promote it on our website and through educate homeowner education courses. Uh, thankfully with the Harris County funding, our authorized agents, which normally would take people to court if they found an issue are now able to refer people to us and allow us to help those homeowners. So it's, it's, it's helping the authorized agents as well, because now as part of their enforcement efforts, they can refer people to us. And as long as those people are showing a good faith effort to replace that system, they don't necessarily have to proceed with a court case against them. Uh, many of our current installers and maintenance providers also refer people to us. And we also post signs in the yards uh, after we do a repair. So some project activity for the, uh, the, the region. Uh, as, of, as of this month, uh, so far we have funded the replacement of 25 failing systems. Uh, most of these have been conventional systems. Uh, we've also done repair of 14 aerobic systems within the region. And we did pump out of seven uh, on-site sewage facilities within Brazoria County. Uh, so far, we have received $417,498 in contributions, 
and has spent a little over 352,000 uh, in repair or replacements. None of none. There's no money allocated to salary um, in in this grant. Uh, minimal for travel, strictly to do the inspection. So almost the entirety of the funding goes to the repair and replacement of those systems. As of right now, we have uh, $65,000 remaining in our accounts um, to continue to do work. So the same information is shown in tabular form, uh, just to, to show you um, kind of the concentration of where, where things are at. Uh, also, the, the ones that are highlighted in orange are the one are the counties that are in the coastal region, the coastal zone. So you can see the the watersheds that we have have worked in, also the number of replacements and repairs, pump outs, and the waiting list. You know, right now we have 37 people on our waiting list still waiting, but only $62,000 left in funding, which is enough to do approximately four to five full system replay, replacements. So um, this, these next uh, series of slides just shows uh, some of the systems that we worked on. Uh, this was a installation of a new uh, aerobic system within Brazoria County. Uh, this homeowner had water surfacing in their backyard. As you can see in the picture on the left, on the picture on the right, they're digging up the old tank to crush it and abandon it in place before installing the new system. Here is one in Double Bayou. We actually did a total of three systems there within the same uh, watershed, two of them actually being next door neighbors. In this case, this homeowner had a small 250 gallon tank that was undersized for the property, was discharging on the surface. So their fix for that was to install a sump pump into the tank and pump it to an oxidation pond in the back of their property, creating this huge open pit of sewage in their backyard. Uh, so we were able to come in, abandon that old system, replace and install a new aerobic system and the leftover dirt from this project was actually used to fill in that, that cesspool in the backyard. Uh, this one, this home is also in Double Bayou. Uh, as you can see in the picture on the right, you can see in towards the front uh, right where the sewer line had broken to the septic tank. Uh, the septic tank wasn't functioning, so it was abandoned. The plumbing was, a new aerobic system was installed and the plumbing rerouted to that system. Uh, this water was discharging directly into the ditch, as you can see on the picture to the left. Um, this, this one was in uh, Bay City down in Magor Matagorda County. Uh, this one had a large discharge of, of raw sewage onto the surface. It was actually flowing into the neighbor's yards. Uh, we were able to replace this one uh, with a on-site system. This homeowner had paid an a unlicensed installer $5,000 to repair his system. That installer took the money and left. And, without repairing it left the homeowner with no funds to, to fix their system. And we were able to come in and, and take care of that one for them. So what's next with our program? Uh, right now, um, we're, our, our funds are almost uh, completely exhausted. Uh, like I said, most of these fundings come from uh, environmental enforcement cases in Harris County. And with the courts being shut down due to COVID-19, that has severely limited the amount of in environmental enforcement that has occurred, unfortunately. Um, so we're hoping that once the COVID situation improves and we, we can get in more money because we have enough homeowners lined up that we would have no problem spending, spending this money in, in helping these people. Um, Unfortunately, we're not actively promoting the program at the time, just because we, we're at a point where we have more people on the waiting list than, than we have money available. Uh, but we are still accepting applicants uh, for the program. Uh, we're also working to identify additional funding sources, uh, such as other grants uh, and local industries that may want to contribute to water quality projects within their area. And as, you know, as soon as we can get more money, we will uh, continue moving forward with uh, repairing those systems. And with that, uh, I'm available for any questions that you may have.
Thank you so much, Brian. If you would uh, stop sharing your screen and we'll get back to the, the main group of participants. That was very informative and a couple of, of thoughts occurred to me in during your presentation. Um, and a lot of the times when you see uh, some of those pictures, it, it, it kind of brings out the gross factor. Now that, that uh, it's when you see it, you, you smell it and you know it um, often, um, with the septic failure points, you really don't even get an understanding that um, when you're in the water body that you've got a failing system nearby. So often as the, the septic stream or the, the um, it's just called the, the uh, inc incomplete treated sewage, as it makes its way down, you don't always see it and smell it or get the gross factor, uh, which brings, brings out some of the mystery when it comes to water quality monitoring and in data analysis. Um, so yeah, I think your your pictures are very insightful there in, in the way you run the program. So so thank you very much uh, for that information. Um, I apologize well, for for the gross pictures right at lunchtime, but I tried to limit the the grossness as best I could. It, it, yeah, it's all good. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in here yet. So just a, a quick prompt for folks um, is um, if you do have questions, please send them in the chat. Uh, we do have yeah. a question question here. Yes, Brian, please go ahead. I was going to say, while, while everybody's typing in their uh, questions, kind of like to ask, uh, you know, this program is, you know, unit to your area. You've kind of talked about some of the steps you went to, you know, into building this program. And we do have partners from, you know, various spots throughout the coast here. Uh, what kind of uh, advice would you give to them? Or like, what would you say if, I was in charge of an area and wanted to start this program. What, what would be some recommendations to get it started or get it off the ground? Okay. Well, like I said, you know, our initial step started with it in 2014 uh, with the development of the SCP project through TCEQ. Uh, so that was, that was our first step, developing that project and starting to promote that. However, it, it took a while to start getting in funding from that. And our primary source ended up being a Harris County District Attorney's Office. Um, and you know, Harris County is also a permitting entity. So they also do enforcement of failing septic systems. So they were aware of the issue and how problematic it was within the region. And so they were to, to help with that. So that was our biggest thing was having that time, that local government support. You know, we appreciate the, the, the state funding, um, you know, obviously, but that it was having that local funding and not having that restriction of not being able to use it on a system that was already under enforcement. So that allowed the counties to actually start referring people to us when their inspectors were going out and identifying issues, they were able to refer known issues to us. So if you can if you can get the tie in from the local government uh, that helps uh, considerably also promoting to the local industries that may be in the area. So we have two two industrial facilities down in Brazoria county that uh, contribute to us through their employee giving program it's an elective program through their uh, through their agencies where you know some people direct their money to different sources and this gives them an option of where they want to direct their funding to and allows us to target those specific regional areas as well. Great, great. thank you for that. We do have a question here from Adrian Hilmi at the Coastal Bend Bay and Estuary Program. Um, and I'm not sure if you can answer this, Brian, but uh, it's, it's not gonna keep me too shy from asking it. Um, are there any tax repercussions to the homeowner who participates in the program? Uh, for example, this certainly results in an increase in property value, but is this considered a taxable gift or service provided by the, uh, as, yeah, so by the state or the IRS? And if so, has this been an issue for the low income homeowners? Um, honestly, I am not 100% certain on that. Um, we have not had any issues uh, reported uh, with that. Uh, like I said, mo most people are on um, uh, Social Security. In um, most cases, uh, the people that we are dealing with are on Social Security or disability. Um, so extremely low income, most under 12,000 a year. Um, I, 
I am not aware of any issues that have come up related to that. I have not, I've had none reported to me. We do provide the homeowners with, you know, copies of the paperwork from the, you know, the installation and things of that nature. Okay. Um, for, for their tax purposes, but, but most of them, because they're on social security, don't file federal taxes anyways, because their income doesn't meet the threshold to require filing taxes. Well, thank you. And, and um, just as a, a quick note for folks, as we're, we're starting to wrap up here, um, we're going to put links into the chat box here uh, for posting of the videos regarding our, our first introduction to Clean Coast Texas in case you want more detail about it. We'll also post another link to our last lunch and learn on beach bacteria. And uh, we also have confirmed our next speaker for next month, which will be Mr. Alex Nunez from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, their kills and spills team. His uh, focus area will be on harmful algal blooms, some of the causative factors, as well as an interesting story or two about his experience on the kills and spills team. We do have another question here from Ms. Adriana Mendez, um, and she has a question about um, after the soil has been contaminated uh, with bacteria, it, oops, it disappeared. Um, is there a persistent risk to human health? How can that be minimized? Uh, no, there really, for, for the amount of water that would come out of, of this type of system, there really isn't a long-term risk. Um, most of these systems work, these occasional systems work through percolation through the soil anyways. So eventually, once the source stops, eventually it will percolate through. Uh, so, and the UV light from the sun will, will, will kill it eventually. Uh, but that's assuming that you stop that source of water. With these, the reason they're problematic is if, if, it's, if it surfaces once, it's not a huge problem because that, those bacteria are going to die off pretty quickly. It's when it's a continual failure and you keep getting that source and then the, the rainwater takes that source somewhere else. It's a problem. So the only type in, it would be like an issue is like the homeowner who thinks they're doing the right thing by creating the cesspool in their backyard to keep it from flowing into the street. But now they have another issue. But we were, like I said, we were able to fill that one, that one in to remediate that. But typically it's not the type of issue like a chemical spill that would require coming in and removing dirt and replacing it, things of the nature. Thank you for that answer. Um, so, so folks, we're going to wrap up here in just a few minutes. Just as a reminder, we have some links uh, also to, to Brian's program at the HGAC. Uh, Leah has also posted a poll question here about, uh, do you receive the Clean Coast Texas emails? And if you don't, this is also an opportunity just to enter your email into the chat box. Um, you won't get spammed from us. You'll get an email from time to time um, about our workshops and uh, updates on the Lunch and Learn series as well. So uh, we're, we're getting ready to sign off. Before we do, I'd like to thank Mr. Brian Sims from the Houston Gal Galveston Era Council of Government for your presentation and willingness to share your expertise and time with us. So thank you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, we'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Todd Running, who's the, a long-term manager in their water resources department at the HJC under his leadership and all the work of the great staff. Uh, HJC is a, a leader in the coastal zone regarding the many different programs and assets and expertise that they bring to the table. So we want to thank the HJC as well um, for all the work that they're doing. Um, on this note, uh, we're ready to do business with you. Please reach out, take a look at our site, cleancoast.texas.gov. And thank you so much for attending this. Hope to see you next month.